Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you on the debate how to write history that is organized by the Scandinavian House. My name is Jan Marek Schick. The event is financially founded by the Municipality of Prague, Municipality of Brno, Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic, and the Finnish Literary Association of Philly. I'm very happy that uh, you have joined us to this discussion with one of the stars of the contemporary Scandinavian literary sky, Chel Vester, whom I welcome here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Chel Vester is author of novels, but also collections of short stories and poetry. He has been nominated three times on the Nordic, Con Nordic Council uh, Literary Award and won it with the novel that, is, uh, that has been also translated into Czech and came out at the beginning of this year under the title of Chimera 38. Uh, your, uh, tell your novel, which is called uh, Mirage uh, 38 in the English translation, uh, was first published in 2013. Uh, since then, you have written another book. Um, my first question is, how does it feel to return to this book after quite a few years? That's quite um, a difficult question to answer, actually. Uh, partly I'm used to this because I have a large readership, mainly in Finland and Sweden, but also in the other Nordic countries. I've had books translated into, into French, German, English, it, Italian, and so, so forth. So in a way, I'm used to having to go back to, to works that were published in the original language already 10 years or eight years uh, or six years ago. Uh, but then in another sense, you can't go back. They have become to some extent uh, when, for example, it's now eight years since Mirage 38 was published in, in, in Sweden and Finland. And, and uh, to some extent, it's like, uh, of course, I, <laughs> I recognize it as mine, but, but in, in some way, it's like it's been written by someone else. I have this, uh, I think it's, it's something strange in my psyche. When, when, I, when people ask me nowadays to read from, from books I wrote, let's say, 20 years ago, uh, if people ask me to read aloud, uh, I start and then after a few sentences, I'm, I'm asking myself, who wrote this? This can't be me. So it would seem I've read these, these books, these novels in some kind of trance-like uh, state. Uh, uh, this is one part of the answer. This is the psychological one. Uh, then speaking in a more realistic sense, it's good, it's always good to return to that book because it's, it's in many ways, I have, I've had other successful novels, but uh, Mirage 38 is my most translated novel. I think it has been uh, up until today translated into some 18, 19 languages. And it was also my first book uh, that broke through with the Swedish reading audience. I've had a large or reading readers, uh, readership in Finland since 1996. But in Sweden, it was um, Mirage 38 that broke the ice. And um, I write my novels, I mean, they are not alike. There are some novels written in a more, let's say, distanced, controlled way, technically. And other, there are other novels where some of the characters might express themselves almost with, with stream of consciousness. Um, uh, Mirage 38 is one of the more controlled ones uh, and as I've grown older I've started to appreciate the ability to say a lot in not so many pages. <laughs> Some of my earlier early novels were uh, even more than 500 pages long and nowadays I think if, even if you're an epic novelist you should manage with three four hundred pages and, and uh, Mirage 38 is exactly 300 pages long in Swedish in the original language. So I'm quite, the book was a good experience for me all in all. And I'm, I'm happy that, that so many countries have chosen to, to translate and publish it. And, uh, and it's always nice to, to return 
to that point. We're also glad that we have it now in check. Uh, let's go a bit deeper into the story. I will sum it up for those who haven't read the, uh, the book yet. Uh, the story takes place in Helsinki in 1938, when the war is already approaching. The main character, Matilda Wieck, uh, has very bad memories from the Finnish independence war, uh, when uh, her family fought on the defeated side and her mother was killed. At the beginning of the book, Matilda becomes a secretary of class Thune, a lawyer who supposes himself to be a friend of the, let's say, lower, lower class. Despite the social gap between them, they become kind of friends, but Matilda is still haunted by the bad memories and that gets even worse when she meets Thune's wealthy friends and finds out that one of them actually tortured her in a prisoner camp 20 years ago during the independence war or after the war. Um, I also, as a reader, but also as a, the, a, the translator of the book, I find the novel quite enchanting because it deals with many different topics. Um, for example, how we deal with our personal history, with history in general and its taboos. It asks questions such, um, can there be an understanding between people who seem to be very different? Or where does the border between indifference and intentional evil lie but what is the main topic for you now <laughs> and what it was some years ago 10 years ago or is it still the same i must confess i mean the book was published in in its original language in 2013 in the autumn of 2013 but actually i started writing it already in 2010 or something so so I don't think I even can can recall uh, what I consider the main topics ten or eleven years ago, uh, but it was a really important book for me. Let's start with with the. I mean, it, it the story is situated in time on the threshold of a new war, the Second World War, but it deals with the the hard and tragic memories of, 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 uh, of the Finnish uh, war of 1918, which was, as you call it, an independence war, but it was also a civil war. And if you're very much still today in 2018, uh, no, 2021, uh, if you're very much to the right, you might call it the freedom war. But then if you're very much to the left, you might still call it uh, the revolution or the class struggle. So this is a war that happened. It, it's an internal war that happened more than 100 years ago. And we still in 100 years haven't been able as a country, even if Finland is a very pragmatic country politically in many ways, we still we haven't been able to dis decide uh, in one, more than 100 years what to call this war. <laughs> So first you have to remember that this, this war, which I call the civil war, was really a traumatic experience for Finland and, and it created many taboos. And 20 years in history is a very short time. So when, when this Mirage 38, this novel takes place in 1938, actually this terrible war and what Finns did to each other during that war, it's yesterday. I mean, we know we who are not that young anymore, like I'm 60, for me 20 years is nothing. These days we have been commemorating 9-11 uh, in the United States. And for a young person, 20 years is a lot, but for me as a 60 year old, I remember it as yesterday. So, um, uh, but you asked me about the main topic. And I would say that when I wrote the book, and still today, the main topic is the suffering of Matilda Wieck uh, during this war, what she had to endure as a quite innocent 17 year old girl who had basically just tried to take care of her little brother and herself when her parents actually went to war to fight on the red side. Uh, and it's about what a civilian, an innocent civilian 
might have to endure during times of conflict, uh, any war, and, and how you deal with that afterwards, how you, how you survive. I mean, when the book uh, was published here in Finland and Sweden, many, many people considered it having two main protagonists, Matilda Wick and, and the lawyer, Klaus Thune. And of course he's important too, but he's more like, he's a mirror or a picture of, of the well-meaning bourgeoisie of that time. And he's, in, he's, he is important in the sense that he tries to befriend this woman from who has been, at least when she was young, on the red side in, in the civil war. Uh, but he's not as important as Matilda Wick is. So she's the main protagonist and, and her fate is to me the most important. Yeah, we, we, in yeah, the we, can, we can talk a little bit about this um, men and women aspect of the, this book or your books in general uh, in a second. Uh, can we maybe go back a little bit to the story? I, I was wondering like, when or how did the story of the book cross your mind? Was it uh, something that you had to process for a long time or was it just a moment like, I have to write about this topic, this suffering of a young mm -hmm. woman? Well, um, first we have to remember, even if um, this is by far my most translated novel, uh, but I had written before this novel I had written already in, in the year 2000, a, a novel was published, which is called, oh, it's really, um, the title is very difficult to, to translate, but it's a novel uh, which deals with a, a Finnish peasant family where the men generation after generation try to make it in Helsinki, in the capital of Finland, and they try to become successful and they almost always fail. And already this novel had uh, had some uh, uh, some small topics concerning this 1918 civil war, independence war. Uh, then in, in 2006, I published uh, a novel called, if you translate the Swedish title, it's called Where Once We Walked. It's been translated into quite many languages, but not as many as, as Mirage 38. And there I dealt really strongly with the war of 1918 with the civil war, the independence war. Uh, and the reason actually that I've dealt so much with this time period in Finnish history, 1917, 1918, of course, this was a revolutionary period in very many countries in Europe, but Finland uh, was a very conflicted country uh, which gained its independence during those years. And when I went to school in, I started school in 1968 and I mainly went to school in, in the seventies, uh, this war and what happened between the red revolutionaries and the white who, who, who defended uh, their point of view, what happened between them was such a big taboo that they didn't tell us at school in the seventies, the truth about how, how cruel this war was and how many atrocities were uh, committed on both sides. And especially I went, I come from a middle-class family. So I went to a bourgeois school, uh, a school for the middle and even maybe the kids of the upper classes and the history teachers, they, they didn't tell us anything about the prison camps and the executions uh, of the Reds after they lost this war. So when I became an adult and I was a journalist and I was interested in history, even if I didn't study it at the university as a, uh, as a main subject, uh, when I started to understand everything that was hidden uh, in that time period in Finnish history, I just had to start writing about it. It, it was, uh, and, and when, when we are coming to, to the beginning of the 2010s, and, and my work on Mirage 38, uh, immediately after, in the new millennium, books, uh, some, there was something, something happened in Finland in the 90s or, or at the beginning of the new millennia. We started, millennium, we started writing, historians also started writing more openly about everything that had happened. 
during the war of, of 1918. And, and in around the year 2010, there were, were many interesting books published, or a few at least, uh, concerning the fate of the women on the red side, on the socialist side. And I read those books and realized that they had put into prison camps and in jail, they had jailed and put into prison camps girls as young as 15, 16, 17, sometimes for going to war and carrying arms and, and, and shooting at, at the white enemy, uh, but many times for almost nothing, for stealing some food to just, you know, to survive. And, and this, uh, this kind of shocked me. And from this knowledge, I think the character of Matilda Week started uh, started growing in me. And then you start doing some additional research on the on the topic or or the, the faith of women. Um, yes, I I knew quite a lot about this period in time in Finnish and also European history already because I had already written two two novels. Uh, which had, if not as well, where once we walked had the Finnish civil war as a main topic. So I knew something, but there were, there's always details. I mean, and there were many details I, that were new for me and that I researched more, researched more thoroughly when I wrote Mirage 38. Uh, mainly, of course, the fate of these young women or these women who were put in prison camps and uh, I mean, there have been, I would, I would put it like this, this is a really difficult subject to talk about, especially in, in a language that's only my third language. Uh, but um, there have been much worse civil wars in the wor world than the one Finland had. But still civil wars are always cruel. Some, something happens in people when they suddenly turn against their own neighbors neighbors and um, I was um, I was somehow so shocked to find out time after time when doing research what what we did to each other and 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 also understanding how deep the scars were that that these atrocities left in in Finland so that mm -hmm. even when I was born and and was a kid and went to school we still couldn't talk openly about it so of mm -hmm. course I I read a lot of um, old letters and, and uh, other, other stuff where I learned more and more about the actual, what happened during the war and what happened to the people in, in the prison camps, what kind of circumstances did they have to, to endure. Um, but there were also more, let's put it like this more, a bit more lighthearted. <laughs> Uh, side topics in the novel that I did uh, research of. Um, for example, I, I included the, the very strange musical instrument, the theremin, in the novel. And because I'm a music person, it was really funny to, to, to explore and re do research about the theremin and, and how it was conceived. And also this small I mean, side theme in the novel also included really exciting and also worrying small facts. For example, that, that the inventor of the theremin was a Russian scientist called Lev Theremin. Uh, he was living in the 30s in Manhattan in New York and suddenly he just disappeared from there. And, uh, and uh, was was then found in Moscow and lived there the rest of his life. And actually when I tried to, to do research on him, it seemed that no one really knew had he been abducted <laughs> by Soviet agents from, from the U United States or, or, or had he just um, suffered homesickness <laughs> and returned home. So could we, could we maybe go a little bit back to these uh, horrible fates? Uh, I know it's... Uh... Of course, hard to, to, to talk about, but that's also what's writing about, writing about horrible things. Uh, did you kind of apply some kind of internal censorship on yourself? Like you, did you come 
across some material that was very exciting in a way. Um, but it was too horrible, too horrible to write about. No, I can't recall, I can't recall that. Uh, I do know, um, mm, I did know at that time, and I still know that there's, it, it would be quite possible because the war was awful and cruel and the aftermath of the war was in a way even crueler. It would be possible if you would just, you know, like collect, res do research and collect the worst atrocities on both sides. You, you could write a book that would uh, depict us human beings in general as, as animals. Uh, but I, I wasn't going that way. Uh, but I did, um, no, I didn't, there wasn't any internal censorship. Uh, I wrote, there are some parts where Matilda Week reminisces when, and she doesn't, she, she doesn't want to do it. Her memories kind of prey suddenly upon her because what she has done during the last 20 years, she's 37 when the novel takes place. So she has been only 17 when she's been in, in the prison camp and she has been violated uh, badly. Uh, and what she has done in the meantime is that she has built a middle-class life. I mean, she's, she's a very competent secretary or, or clerk and she, she has quite a good salary. She lives uh, in a decent apartment in a well-to-do part of, of, of Helsinki. And then suddenly everything she thought she has left behind her comes back when she meets or sees among Tuna's friends, this man whose voice she recognizes, not his looks, his voice, because the violations, the, the rape incident, incidents have happened uh, at night in the dark. So the memories start coming back to her, even if she would not, if, even if she doesn't obviously want to. Uh, and I tried to write those when she remembers, uh, I tried not to censor myself. I tried to write those parts as cruelly and as, I mean, without disguising the facts how inhuman the conditions were during the summer of 1918 in those camps. Even, even when, when, when they stopped shooting the red prisoners as a retribution because the, uh, the highest military official, Manahem, he actually forbid them to do it. There came a very clear command that this killing must, must stop. In my opinion, it came too late, but it came. But then even after that, I mean, the conditions in Finland during the summer of 1918 were such we had been, I mean, this was the first world war and Finland had been a grand duchy in, in, in Russia and, and the whole of Russia was a, had been a chaos for more than a year. And Finland was a chaos and even the winning side, even, even the bourgeoisie didn't have that much. I mean, they had to eat, but I mean, there was, um, there was shortage everywhere so so the conditions in the prison camps were they were absolutely awful i mean people died from diseases but they also starved to death and they tried to eat anything they could find you know in the dirt in the ground from the trees not to starve and i, I tried to de depict this actually what i was I guess i was trying to depict is what a miracle it is that anyone and many people did survive, but it's actually a miracle that people, the human being can, can survive uh, incredibly. Um, the human being can, can survive really, really tough hardships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go a bit to this difference between writing about men and women now. <laughs> It's a kind, I find it quite interesting that 
uh, I completely agree with with you that Matilda is the 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 main hero of the of of the book. I I think that Tuna is uh, far more passive than Matilda. Uh, mm -hmm. He's he's only um, reflecting his environment, not actively taking or kind of taking actively part in it, but only in some extent. Um, was it easier for you to write about? Tune or Matilda? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, I because I got such an impression that you uh, prefer maybe writing more about men and their worlds. <laughs> am I? Am I from, uh, from where? Uh, from where do you have that impression? Uh, for example, from your no, uh, from your newest uh, novel, Tritonus. You know, okay. No friendship of two. Minutes. No, this this is okay. This is a long story. I have to give one of my my endless <laughs> meandering answers again. Uh, I I got a lot of criticism at the beginning of my writing career when I started writing prose from 1989 onwards. First, I started with short story collections, then novels. Uh, up until I was 35, 40, I, I got a lot of, or I got some criticism for for having thin portraits of women uh, in my books and, and writing mainly about the power struggle between boys and, and between men. Um, I never wanted it to be like that, but I can see now when I have perspective and, and when I look back, I can see that, um, yeah, it, it was maybe that way because when, when I was young, I, I just, and actually I don't know, the, this many years afterwards, I can't say, did, did I lack the psychological skill or the writer's skills to write about women or was I just scared? Was it easier to write about men because I myself am a middle-class heterosexual, in some senses maybe unconventional, but still quite, quite a conventional man. I don't know, but this was, how it was and I think the novel I mentioned earlier where once we walked from 2006 was the first novel I wrote where I had a couple or at least one really strong female protagonist uh, an upper upper class uh, rebel in in the 1920s and 30s uh, and since that uh, I've continued I mean Matilda Wieck is probably perhaps the, the strongest female character I've had in a book, but also in a novel called um, The Sulfur Yellow Sky, if you translate it in, into English, uh, a novel that was published in 2017. Uh, there's a very strong female character called Stella, which the whole story kind of evolves around. So I, I think nowadays I vary. I mean, you are quite right. Tritonus, uh, my latest novel, uh, has uh, two more than 50 years old to, to middle-aged uh, male protagonists. But this time I wanted to depict the friendship between aging men. So you have different objectives as a writer with different novels. So nowadays I think that uh, the criticism I received when I was a young writer that I'm only interested in the power struggle between boys and men is absolutely not true. But then we come to another problem. When I write about women, more nowadays than I used to do in, in my stories, in my novels and short stories, uh, you might get these accusations of appropriation. I mean, this is a sensitive subject, at least in the Nordic countries, or has been for the last few years. There are female readers who, I mean, at the start, Quite at the start of, of Mirage 38, there's a scene where Matilda Wieck goes home from, from the office. She takes the tram and, and her stomach hurts because, because her period is, is starting. And there was actually a, I don't know, there was some web forum where a, a female reader wrote that she felt offended that I, as a, uh, uh, a writer, uh, a masculine writer, uh, a man writer, dared to, to write about a woman who is about to have her period. 
And this is how absurd this discussion of, of appropriation at times might get. And I, I mean, to me, it's difficult to apprehend that there would be any sense in this kind of reaction because literature has always been about transcendence. I mean, if men wouldn't be allowed to write one single word about women or have female uh, protagonists, we wouldn't have Anna Karenina and we wouldn't have Madame Bovary and we wouldn't have many other uh, really important figures from world literature. Uh, sorry for being maybe a bit absurd, but can you think yourself uh, uh, writing a novel oh, completely only about women? <laughs> Maybe just uh... yeah. no. This is a good. This is actually a good question, and and my answer is no. But then again, I would not uh, be at all interested in writing a novel without women, women, or only about men either. I mean, a kind of. I mean, the only example I can imagine, I get in my mind, you know, just off the cuff, right now is Lord of the Flies. That's that's young boys. But I'm trying to search for other novels where there would be only men. And for me, the, the interaction and the, and the, the interaction and, and also all the passion and all the mm, now I'm looking for a word I can't find. The tension between men and women is so interesting that to me it's 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 obvious that my novels and my even my short stories have to have people of, of all sexes. <laughs> mm. yeah. but let's go to another tensions, uh, and that's um, the tension between uh, today's words, history, future, mm. time, the world as it used to be, the world that is now uh, about writing history, interpreting and reinterpreting history. You know a lot about this. Um, your, your novels somehow work with the history of Finland throughout the, 20, the whole 20th century. That's true. Uh, can, you, can you maybe first uh, describe how you, you've talked about it a little bit that you've already written quite a lot of historical novels, but can, can you describe how your literary path has led you to, to this genre, to the genre of novel and the genre <clears throat> of the historical novel? Okay, I start with the novel. Uh, as a young man, I was really, really impatient. So my dream would have been perhaps to have the talent to write the perfect three, four minute pop songs. And if I would have had that talent, I played the guitar and I played in bands, all my hobby bands all my life. If I would have had that talent, I would perhaps not have become a, uh, a writer of books. And this impatience I have in me, it, it showed when I was young, I mean, uh, I didn't, start by uh, studying literature at the university. Uh, I went to a journalist school. I studied journalism and sociology, and then I became a journalist. And then I started writing poetry because it seemed the, the density of poetry seemed like the perfect contrast to, to the quite uh, fact-based <laughs> and pragmatic world of journalism. Uh, then again, I always, knew still that I wanted to tell stories. And it was also logical that when I moved from, I wasn't in my own, own opinion and not in others, in the opinion of other, other people, a very good poet. So when I moved to prose, I moved to short stories. And, and this, was, this had to do with the impatience I have in me. I was used as a reporter, as a journalist to, to maybe use, um, one week or two weeks on a story uh, and, and the perspective, the thought of, of having to spend years researching for and writing a novel was really scary to me. Uh, so it was a long, actually not very long. I mean, I was 34, 35 when my first novel was published, but then at that point in time, I had written professionally for 13 years already going from journalist to poet to short story writer, doing all these 
you know, at the same time. And, and my way to the novel was quite long, actually. And the first novel I wrote and published in 1996, when I was 35, its title, its title uh, translated into English would be The Kites Above Helsinki. Uh, and uh, it was um, what you could call a generational novel. It was a novel about my, the youth uh, and, and the... Um, It was a novel about the life of my generation up to the, let's say, early middle age or, or to the end of our uh, uh, young years. And um, at that point in time, maybe I knew I wanted to write historical novels too, and maybe I didn't, I, I don't know. But after that novel, and, and it was quite a success in Finland, it, 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 gave me a really big readership in, in both Swedish, in both the Swedish and Finnish language here at home. Uh, and I actually by instinct, uh, first there was a year when I just traveled, you know, to libraries and, and places and spoke, talked about this book that had been so, and was so popular. But then when, when I got free, from that, uh, I went into the National Library and started researching, uh, doing research about life in Helsinki at the beginning of the 20th century. So intuitively, I, I knew I, I wanted to, to go back in history and write, write about uh, the history of Helsinki and, and, and the history of Finland during the 20th century, especially at the beginning of the century. And I think there are a couple of explanations. Uh, this is a very long answer. Do you want to ask a question no, here? No, no, go on, go on. Yeah, I will <laughs> ask maybe afterwards. Okay, I, I'll try to, to... There are a few reasons and I, I try to give, give them to you shortly. First, there was the fact that my, my family was actually a rural family. My, my parents grew up in, in another part of Finland and moved to Helsinki to study and stayed here. And I was the first one in my family ever to be born in Helsinki. So the city where I grew up, where I went to school, where we moved around my family very much because my father who had been very poor as a child was successful in his work. So we, we started out maybe as a, we lived in the suburbs and were maybe a lower middle-class family. And then we, we got more affluent, more wealthy and we moved to, to uh, more affluent parts of the city. And still I had no roots. In Helsinki. So my interest in Helsinki came from the fact that it wasn't actually the home of my family. My family came from elsewhere. And this was very typical in Finland in the 60s and 70s because the country uh, got urbanized very fast from being still in the 1920s and 30s. Finland was a quite rural country where many people lived in the countryside and the cities were very small. And, and there was a mass urbanization after the Second World War during the 50s, 60s, 70s. And my family was absolutely a part of that. So this was one reason I got interested in, in historical novels with a special eye on Helsinki. Then there were the wars. We had this, uh, apart from, from the civil war or independence war of 1918, uh, during the Second World War, we had two wars against the Soviet Union, the Winter War in the winter 1939-40, and the Continuation War between 1941 and 44. Both my grandfathers died there in the war. The first one in the Winter War, the second one in the Continuation War. Uh, my grandmothers, who were very uh, religious people, never got remarried, or I don't think ne either one of them met a man, they became widows when they were 29 and 27, I think, and then they just stayed war widows and they uh, had their children. Uh, my paternal grandmother had one and my father and my maternal grandmother had two. And there was such a sorrow in my family when I grew up. Uh, we had these two men, in quite young men, in uniforms on my mother's piano 
it's a little bit of bourgeoisie cliche, the photos on the piano, but that's how it was. And, uh, and my grandmothers were kind of, you know, even 20, 30 years afterwards, they were stricken with grief, so they didn't speak. I knew nothing about my grandfathers. And I think the, the silence, the ve veil of silence we had in my family about the past, about history, there was no, there was no, no shame in it. These men were heroes. They had died in the war defending Finland, but there was sorrow. There was a really deep sorrow and, and no one spoke about the past. And I think that's how I got interested in the past. So without having any actual plans, I started buying Helsinkiana books about old Helsinki, but also books about the Finnish war history and stuff like that from, from, from the bookstores and and from shops, you know, selling used books already when I was 30 or even less than 30. Mm. So this is this is how I kind of but it didn't it it, it never felt like a, an actual decision. I kind of floated into do it into mm. into do it, doing this that that I do. Mm. When you speak about this family silence and things like that i i can't you know i i just have to wonder like why haven't you became um become a historian or so, something like that why fiction right uh, because mm -hmm. this is a real question because i have i have many friends who have who are historians and uh, and i've talked with them about this subject, I feel I feel a kinship with them. We talk about history, but I'm, uh, I mean, I loved writing uh, essays and stories already when I went to school, and and I was good at Swedish and Finnish. So my my stories were I was too shy myself, so I couldn't do it. But the teacher many times uh, read those stories in front of the class aloud, uh, and. Uh, and in these stories, I lied, of course. I invented things. And the big difference, I mean, I could have become a historian, but even, even as a journalist, even as a reporter, when I was a young man working at the biggest Swedish speaking daily here in Helsinki, I, 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 um, I had morals. I came back to the uh to the premises uh went into my room and started writing i never lied but i was always thinking about if i had made an interview i was always thinking oh if he would have said that instead of what he actually said it would be a much better story so this is the reason reason and i've, I've had um i have had i've had many occasions during the years because i'm quite a realist writer I'm a geographical realist, novelist, and I'm a psychological realist. And I write about Helsinki in a way, in a manner that makes people recognize, you know, streets, houses, maybe even bars and clubs where they've been. And then they kind of look at me as, you know, an ethnologist or a historian. And I always have to remind people here in Helsinki, not abroad, uh, but here in Helsinki, that you must remember, I'm not a historian. I'm not an ethnologist. I'm a novelist. I lie. <laughs> of course, uh, now I now I sound like there would be no moral implications of all this. There are, of course, even a liar has a responsibility. Mm. Finnish history during the 20th century, it's so bloody and it's so cruel and it's so full of sorrow and people dying in wars that, of course, uh, it's not that I invent things lightheartedly. I know this history and I'm trying to, uh, I've been using a quote from Siri Hustvet, the American author. I think she once said or wrote somewhere that um, uh, you write novels about things that could have, had, could have happened. And, and I've used this quote uh, when I write about Finnish history I always write, I, I, I call it the plausibility theory. I write about things that could have happened and most likely also have happened, but I'm a novelist, so it's fiction. 
and I invent my protagonists and I invent the events of my novels. But uh, what's what's so fascinating about inventing, about writing history? <laughs> what's what's better? Like you said that you were somehow pushed by something to to do that. Can you can you put a name to it? I don't think I can. I don't think I can put a name to it. I would like to be able to put a name on it because I mean there are a lot of novelists, good novelists, excellent novelists who are absolutely content with uh, with picking a person, an actual person from history, and building a novel around this person with this person as the main protagonist, and and doing this they must be loyal to to this person's actual personal history. I mean, when there are when there are blank spaces, when there are moments when no one knows where this actual historical person was that night or thought or said that night, they, they are allowed to invent things. But if you write a, a novel about a person who has existed and everyone knows that this person was, let's say, in New York one certain evening in 1938, you can't put this person in Japan that night, you just can't. Uh, and people make, people write great novels this way. But for me, it has been clear from the beginning, I'm, I'm using actual historical figures uh, at the borders, in the margins of my stories. But it's been clear to me from the beginning that I have to invent my own protagonists. And that's why I have to read a lot and watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of <clears throat> letters and and uh, diary <clears throat> notations to to be able to <clears throat> to build this this actually fictitious persons from from that era i'm i'm visiting or where I'm. do you think that there can be something risky about writing historical fiction oh it is uh, i mean yes it can be risky and i don't know people have been mostly very kind to me here at home but of course, I mean, what Finland had in 1918 was actually a civil war with neighbors turning against each other at the same time as it was an independence war. And what we had in, in, in the 1940s was a terrible struggle to stay independent. And, and there was such a lot of suffering of death and, and many of the men who returned from the war actually psychologically they never recovered when i was a kid in the 60s 70s there was there was there were legions of old vinyls in the streets of helsinki and i didn't realize it then when i was 10 or 15 years old but as i got older and as i myself became an adult i realized that most of those men were soldiers who came physically back from the war, but uh, psychologically not. So, uh, of course, when, when you have these tensions and you have these tensions in the past, uh, of course, there's a risk writing about history. And I'm sure there are readers of my books. I hope there's not very many of them, but I'm sure there are readers of my books here at home in Finland who think uh, I have the wrong, I mean, my the, if there's a tendency in my books politically, it's leftist liberal. I'm, I'm, I've never, I never became a good socialist. I'm too individualist for that. But, but it's a leftist liberal worldview, and it's a leftist liberal view on Finnish history. And I'm sure there's people who who don't like that view. But I have, I haven't been. Of course, I've received some criticism, all writers do, but I haven't been uh, very abused or attacked. There's been attacked. There's been a few minor incidents, but that's all. But still, but anyways, I mean, I mean, life is a serious, serious thing. <laughs> so there's, I mean, to me, right now I'm writing a, a book of short prose dealing with the passing of time and mm. how fast the, the world has changed since I was a kid. And I'm writing this book together with my brother, who's also a poet and, and short story writer and translator. And, 
uh, and many of the texts uh, I was writing one today before we <laughs> we started our meeting uh, and and it felt dangerous. I mean, writing is writing can be dangerous in in a very um, let's say open uh, way, which has to do with other people getting angry about what you write. But writing is also <laughs> at times dangerous in a psychological way. I mean, you can you can discover traits in yourself that you didn't know that you had and that you don't like. <laughs> Mm. Or you can, um, or you can, or you can accidentally plunge in, into your own darkness. Many artists have done that during the centuries, and some never come back. I, I maybe don't want to go um, very deep into this, but it's fascinating what you're talking about. But so, are there are there some things that you would never write about? Maybe some uh, some time periods uh, or some topics, something that you know that no, no, it's uh, no way. Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, I have this distinct notion of being a very modern. I mean, I'm a, I'm a person that belongs to modern modern modernity. Uh, I have the greatest admirations admiration for for novelists or writers or playwrights who write about Roman emperors or who write about um, the European society of let's say the 18th century. I've sometimes joked, I get this question about how far back in time would I be prepared to go? I get these questions quite a lot from my readers. And I always answer, I need, uh, I need electric light, I need trams, I need cars, <laughs> and I need a society where, there's, uh, a, where people have the opportunity to be upwardly socially, socially mobile. So I, I can't, I, I've never gone, the oldest scene in any of my novels is from the summer of 1890. And I don't think I can go much further back in time than that. Uh, so that, that's one answer ab about epochs. I'm, I'm writing about mod modernity. Um, then about topics, let's put it like this. Um, today's world is so complicated and also quite cruel in many ways. And there are fates, there are destinies of human beings in today's world that I as a quite well-to-do uh, white middle-class writer in his early 60s, who also grew up in, not, not we were not affluent when I grew up, but we were not poor either. Uh, the problems in my family when I grew up were more on a psychological level than on a level having to do with having food on the table and, and so on. So there are destinies in today's world that I wouldn't write about because these people or some, someone closer to, to the destinies of these people are the ones who should write about it. So I'm, I'm taking this appropriation discussion that we've had. I don't know if you had it in Czech literature, for example, during the last years, but in the Nordic countries, it's been really, it's been quite on the surface these last few years. And I recognize that I wouldn't, for example, in, if, even if I would do research for years and years, uh, I wouldn't write a novel, for example, about uh, with the protagonist being a, a young girl from the poorer parts of the world who is subject to trafficking and has to prostitute herself. I mean, I can put myself, I, I have mm. compassion, I can put myself in, in the place of other people and understand their plight, but there's a limit. I just wouldn't mm. understand deeply enough, so I wouldn't write. Mm. I would never try to write that story mm. as a journalist, maybe, but not, not as not a not as a fiction fiction writer. No. Uh, um, I'm I'm sorry to the to the audience because I haven't uh, told you that you can ask our guests <laughs> uh, any questions, but some of you have understood. 
to it that uh, you can. So we actually have a, a question. So uh, let's uh, go to them. And the other ones, uh, if you hesitate to write, uh, you can write in Czech, in, uh, in English, in Swedish, Finnish, uh, uh, French, maybe, I don't know. Spanish. Uh, Spanish. <laughs> yeah. For me, uh, Spanish is okay. Okay, so, but we have one in, uh, in, in English. Um, and it is uh, in English and Dutch translation, the book meaning uh, Mirage is called the Wednesday Club. Is the society slash club life as depicted in Hagring 38 something typical for Finland's Swedes living in Helsinki or other towns in that time? Uh, yes, this this kind of um, uh, this kind of, of um, private club where only men meet and and drink and sometimes eat and then discuss you know politics and society. Uh, they are quite common. They were quite common uh, in the Nordic countries at least. I don't know about Central Europe, for example. And and what looking at history and 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 the past, what's always intrigued me is, is why did they find it interesting? I'm still, I mean, there are still uh, societies which are like all male panel, male only. And I can't see, to me, it's, it's not very interesting. I mean, to, to, to close, you know, to leave out half of the possible members you could have to have a, a, a lively discussion it's it's i mean it's ridiculous in my opinion but i i created the wednesday club in the book as they are a mirror for the political discussion in at least in in finland but maybe in in, in large parts of europe in 1938 and and my depiction is i don't know if everyone has noticed noticed that but my depiction is ironic i mean these men are sitting you know they are drinking uh, uh they are drinking expensive whiskey they are eating ex expensive uh, meals they are discussion they, they are discussing hitler and stalin and they have this uh, you say in german besser visa you know know it all attitude and at the same time in the streets in the world outside their confinement outside their windows, the world is falling apart. The world is falling into, into atrocities and cruelty once again, and they just don't notice it. They are completely blind. It's more important for them to, to convince the other members of the club that they are the best, uh, uh, that they are the ones who, who have uh, the political knowledge the economical knowledge, the, the right interpretation of what's happening. And fact is they don't know anything about what's happening. And of course, this is, a, this is also, this is a part of the folly of, of those times, but this is also a very, <laughs> this is also a very human condition because I've, I've thought about it these last years when first we had, uh, the climate crisis was suddenly on everyone's lips, uh, partly thanks to Greta Thunberg and, and other movements. And then shortly after that came the pan pandemic. And we also live in a world, I mean, look at what happened in Afghanistan just a few weeks ago. Uh, we live in a very strange and fast moving and also dangerous world. And I don't think I don't think even the best political or economical economical analyst of these times can see through the times we are living in. We never see through the times we are living in. And that's also the tragedy of the Wednesday Club. Mm -hmm. They talk and talk and talk and they think they know everything, but they are quite blind. Okay, I'm sorry. We also talk and talk and talk. <laughs> yes. And uh, our time is slowly running out. But I, I, I want to have one last question because you touched upon it right when, uh, right now, when you were answering this question from the audience. Um, uh, predictions. 
because in your uh, newest uh, novel, Tritonus, you, you did uh, kind of prediction because uh, actually it was published last August, if I'm not mistaken. August. Actually, yeah, 20, August 20. And it actually described uh, what was about to become our closed future as the story ends uh, in June 21. Mm -hmm. So you were kind of making, like thinking about what will come. Uh, why this turn to the closest future? And you also have uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic in the, in, the, in the book and very actual, uh, very topics that uh, were very from the current situation. Why this? You mean why changing from historical novels to contemporary exactly. writing? Well, fact is, this is what I've been doing all my career. Uh, I have, I don't know if I, yes, I was clear about it. I have a background as a journalist, even if I left journalism to become a, a fiction writer when I was just 29 or something like that. But I have this background as a journalist and I've always been, I'm interested in history but I'm also interested in contemporary society and what happens in the world right now. So for me, it's, it's not opportunistic. It's something that it comes deep from my way of looking at the world that when I write contemporary, I almost intuitively include uh, topics like, for example, the pandemic or Me Too or, or topics like, uh, like that. And I've been, you know, going back and forth between historical and contemporary novels uh, all my writing career, actually, for 25 years now. Also, the, the novel before Tritonus, Ben uh, Svavel Gula Himland, The Sulfur Yellow Sky, is more of a contemporary novel than a historical one. But right now, then again, it will take a few years. I'm quite at the beginning still, but now I'm writing about uh, Finland between the winter war and the continuation war. I'm trying to place a novel in 1940-41. So this is just, it comes natural. It's natural for me. It comes naturally to do like this. Okay, so we just hope that uh, the writing process will go on smoothly. Yes. And the novel will be finished soon, or will it be? I hope so. I also hope that I have a plan to include class two in it from from Mirage 38. Really? As, not not as a main character, but as a small mm -hmm. character in the new novel. Let's see if it works out that way. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Chell, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. We don't have any more questions. Uh, so just uh, let me thank you for being here with us and uh, have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you. Nice talking to you.